Now, verse 26 begins with these six words. And as they led him away. I mean, Jesus is supposed to be leading us. Your life, your family, your finances, your business, no matter what, every day, the best decision is to let Jesus lead. If you're going to make some determination about whether something's true or not, start with the Bible. End with the Bible. Well, Luke, he tells the story of the crucifixion in four words. That's it. He said, there they crucified him. The cross reveals the love of God as nothing else in the world ever has. It's the greatest demonstration, the greatest expression, the greatest illustration of the love of God for every man, woman, boy, and girl who's ever lived. While the people watched and the rulers mocked and the soldiers gambled for his garments, you know what Jesus did? Verse 34, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now all the mocking, all the scoffing, all the laughing, all the blaspheming stopped at high noon. You say, why? Because God covered the whole land with darkness. And he ripped the veil in two and he opened access into his presence. No more would sinners need earthly temples or altars or sacrifices or priests because all had now been fulfilled in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And then verse 46 says, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. The fickle crowds who'd come for a show were now on their way home, grieving with guilt and fear. That's why they were beating their breasts. What were we a part of? What did we do? Those close to Jesus stood back, unable to bear what they had seen. This wasn't how it was supposed to end. The final verse of our text from last week, marks one of the saddest moments in all of human history. Jesus had just been crucified in one of the most heinous, cruel executions of all time. Found innocent of all charges, yet nailed to a Roman cross in front of a mocking crowd. Isaiah described how he looked. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah wrote that hundreds of years before it took place, but every detail was precisely accurate. After six hours of indescribable, excruciating pain, Luke says he cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. The centurion standing next to him that witnessed everything praised God, Luke says, and said, certainly this man was innocent. The crowds that had gathered for this spectacle were all on their way home, ashamed, ridden with guilt, beating their chest. And then there's that verse, verse 49. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. It wasn't supposed to end like this. They stood there in shock, surprise, overwhelmed by sorrow and sadness. What would happen now? Jesus is dead. The same Isaiah who wrote way before it happened gives us a clue. He says in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 8 and 9, he was cut off from the land of the living, 
And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. A rich man. We pick up the narrative in Luke chapter 23, verse 50. It's not over. Yeah, but Jesus is dead. You're right. But God isn't done. He never is. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 50. Luke writes, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen, in a linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I want to tell you up front, we're going to see some amazing things in this passage this morning. The first one, we're going to see compassion. Luke says, now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. I like what John Phillips said. He said, and I quote, God provided a Joseph to superintend the birth of his son and a Joseph to superintend his burial as well. God wasn't done. He never is. And look who he used. Verse 50, he was a member of the council. That's the Sanhedrin. But he was a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. Don't miss this. God had a believer on the very council that called for Jesus' death. And not just one, but two. John tells us in his gospel, John 19, verses 38 to 42, there was another man there as well who did not consent, Nicodemus. Remember in John chapter 3, he had come to Jesus at night because he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he talked to Jesus about the kingdom of God, and Jesus told him in John 3, 3, you must be born again if you want to go to heaven. So both Joseph and Nicodemus were members of the Sanhedrin, but they had not been present at that council meeting at dawn that morning. Say, how do we know that? Because Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 14, verse 64, tells us the whole council condemned Jesus to death. That would have been impossible if they had been there. Somehow they were not there. They were believers. They, they believed in Jesus. They would have never consented to that decision. But now they're going public with their faith. No more secret disciples for Joseph and Nicodemus. Luke says this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Verse 53 says, Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. There's your rich man. Only the wealthy could have tombs like that that had already been prepared, but nobody had used them yet. In fact, you know what happened to most of the uh, criminals after they were crucified, after their bodies were taken down? Their bodies were loaded on a cart or an animal, and they were taken down to the valley of Gehenna and put in a burning trash heap, literally a precursor of what hell was going to be like. The other two criminals, that's where they went, but Joseph said, I'd like to have the body of Jesus. So Isaiah was right. He was with a rich man in his death who cared for him. Chuck Swindoll said, and I quote, Jesus died on a Friday afternoon. Jews referred to the day before a Sabbath as the day of preparation. No work could be done on the Sabbath. Thus, anything you needed on Saturday had to be prepared on Friday before sundown. With nightfall approaching, 
Joseph and those helping him found themselves pressed between two Old Testament commandments. They were pushed by Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, which required the body of someone who had been executed to be buried that same day, but also bound by the requirement to stop all work for the Sabbath. They had just enough time to hurriedly wrap his body in linen, apply at least some of the spices, and place him inside the burial cave. An enormous stone covered the entrance to keep grave robbers out and the odors of decomposition in. So the first thing we notice in our passage is compassion. But next we notice commitment. Verse 54, Joseph and Nicodemus weren't alone. Luke says the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Don't miss the commitment of these women who had faithfully followed Jesus for quite some time now. They'd been with Jesus in Galilee. They'd been at the cross. Now here they are at the tomb. They had watched everything with tears too many to count, and the ability to replay every single detail. Now they're watching Joseph and Nicodemus as they quickly but gently and carefully are attending to their Lord's lifeless body. Dr. Phillips adds, so the Lord was crucified on the preparation day of the feast. He was buried in haste before six o'clock in the afternoon, before the high day, the first day of the feast began which was the Sabbath, everything had to be done in haste. The linen was torn into strips and wound limb by limb around the body between layers of myrrh and aloes, the head wrapped separately in a napkin. Then the body was laid to rest in the niche of the tomb. The great stone that served as a door was rolled heavily and securely into place. The Passover lamb was dead, and the Jewish Passover was now obsolete. Verse 56, Luke says, then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. In other words, the the, the women who'd been there, they knew they were going to need more spices and more ointments. Say, Say, why? Well, they didn't embalm bodies. The Jewish people did not embalm bodies. So the decomposition would sit in immediately and the odor would be so horrible, so they would overwhelm it with spices and ointments. So they went home hurriedly to prepare all these spices and ointments so they could come back after the Sabbath and anoint the lifeless body of Jesus. They could do no work on the Sabbath. No Jew did anything. The whole city would shut down. If you you go to a Jewish city today like Jerusalem, the same thing happens. The only people moving around doing stuff are people who are not Jews. They take it very seriously. In fact, they have elevators in in, uh, Israel that are called Shabbat elevators. Say, what are those? They automatically go to floors and stop at every one. You don't have to push a button because they believe that pushing a button would be work, and that's not allowed on the Sabbath. And by the way, before you want to make fun of them for little things like that, what about the little idiosyncratic things you and I do? We all have our little idiosyncrasies that we, there's little things that we do that other people would look at us and go, why in the world do they do that? Like when you drive out of your driveway, why do you look back to make sure that door has gone all the way down? Oh, I never do that. I found myself doing that this morning. I thought, what in the world? Just a little thing. So they hurried back. They prepared spices. They were, they were ready to go, but, but they had to rest on the Sabbath. So we see compassion. We see commitment. Now we see confusion. Chapter 24, verse 1, but on the first day of the week, Sunday, at early dawn, as they went to the tomb, they took the spices they had prepared. Now, the Jewish people didn't have names for days of the week. We do. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They don't have names for days of the week like that. Well, we do. In fact, I tell people all the time, the only, the only days that I'm, I'm willing to go golfing are days that end with Y. 
But now to the Jews, the, the seventh day was the day of rest. That was the Sabbath. They were following, the Sabbath was established to, to commemorate creation. On the seventh day, God rested. And so on the Sabbath day, every Jew rests. It's the seventh day. So Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, is the first day of the week. Here's something you may not know. That Saturday that Jesus' body was in the tomb was the last official Sabbath. It all ended after that. Everything changed. In fact, you go to the New Testament, and uh, the believers are celebrating on the first day of the week now. Why? Because of the finished work of Christ. On the first day of the week, he came out of the tomb. In fact, there's an interesting verse. If you turn back over to Colossians, back in uh, the epistles of Paul, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, listen to what Paul says about Sabbaths. He says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. You know, you can go back to the Old Testament and even the, uh, the design of the tabernacle, the building of the tabernacle. Every, every piece of wood, every, every, um, every color that was used there, the, the, the silver, the gold, the bronze, the purple, it all was, was pointing toward Jesus Christ. The Sabbath was, was pointing toward Jesus. Now, now we rest in Him. He's the reality. And by the way, if you're hanging on to any of that old stuff, you're hanging on to shadows which makes about as much sense as getting off an airplane out of DFW airport and you've been gone for a whole month and your spouse comes to meet you on the tarmac and you come walking down those stairs like the president does off the airplane, you know those deals, and, and, and instead of, you're not going through a tube, you're walking down stairs and you walk down the stairs and the sun is shining and your spouse comes up to greet you and hug you and, and give you a kiss and you dive for the ground and start hugging the shadow and kissing the, the shadow. And you'd probably be arrested and taken away for evaluation. <laughs> Anyone, any religion that attempts to hang on to the shadows instead of Jesus is doing the exact same thing. They are a shadow of what was to come in Christ. Dr. Phillips said they, they all believed Jesus to be forever dead. Yet he still reigned in their hearts. Now don't miss this. The men were still sleeping, hiding from the authorities, keeping a low profile. But these noble women were up at the crack of dawn and on their way to the tomb. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, it was all a scam. It was all a ruse. They all, you know, it was all a story they put forth to, to say he rose from the dead. There wasn't any of those people doing that. They knew he was dead. Dr. Kent Hughes adds, we must not let our knowledge of the glorious revelation that awaited them dull us to the dark sackcloth covering these women's souls. They were depressed, exhausted, mourning with no hope whatsoever, and according to Mark, fretting over how they would get into the tomb. Mark 16, 3. They did not expect anything except more sorrow. He says, if you take flowers to the cemetery, do you expect to see an empty grave? And if you do see one, would it occur to you that the deceased had risen from the dead? Of course not. Well, verse 2 tells us they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now they were definitely confused. Apparently, they assumed Jesus' body had been stolen. In fact, that's what John tells us, John chapter 20, verse 13. He says, that's exactly what Mary Magdalene said. They've, they've taken my Lord's body. She didn't know who or where. You know, here's, here's what a lot of people miss about the whole Easter story. The empty tomb didn't erase their doubts. It actually increased them. They're totally confused. Who tampered with the body? Who'd taken the Lord? They had no answers. But then suddenly their confusion turned into conviction. Number four. While they were perplexed about this, verse four, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. 
Now they were terrified. In fact, verse 5 tells us, they were frightened and they bowed their faces to the ground. Now, these weren't just two men. Both Matthew's gospel and John's gospel tells us, tell us they were angels. And in verse 5, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? It was a mild rebuke. They weren't encouraging them. They weren't blessing them. They were rebuking them. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? They had come to anoint the lifeless body of Jesus when they should have known he would rise from the dead. Verse 6, they told them, he is not here, but is risen. Chuck Swindoll said, the angel's rhetorical question suggests the women should have known better than to look for Jesus in the tomb, or at least they should not be so perplexed. The declaration, he is risen, is a passive verb. He has been raised. Most likely it's a divine passive, implying that God has done the raising. And in verse 6, the angels said, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Now, don't miss this. That was not a question. That was a statement. Remember what he told you. He said he was going to be crucified. He said he was going to be buried. He said on the third day he was going to rise from the dead. That's what he said. Jesus had predicted his resurrection, and they should have expected it. Obviously, they didn't. So how do you know that? Because they brought spices and ointments to anoint the body. I love what Dr. Phillips said. He said, quote, surely the thing thing about the people of our planet that must perplex the angels more than anything else is our chronic unbelief. How could anyone forget such truths as Jesus had taught his own? The angels came from a land where there are no tombs. That men should have murdered heaven's beloved was beyond all thought. That he should rise through the grave clothes and walk out the wall and vanish from view was all to be expected. Verse 8. Luke says, and they remembered his words. He did say that. I remember remember that. He told us. He said, he's... You talk about a seismic shift in their hearts. In a matter of a few seconds, they went from mourning to dancing. You know why? Because they remembered his words. Friend, listen to me. We need to remember his words. I said we need to remember his words, all of them. You say, well, I don't know all of them. That's why you need to be here every Sunday, every Lord's Day. So sometimes I'm traveling. You ought to watch on live stream TV like my daughter and her new husband are doing on their honeymoon. They better be watching on. She picked, this is the last outfit she picked out for me before she left. Next week it's back to all my old stuff, folks. You're just going to have to deal with me, but no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, that's why you ought to be here every Lord's Day. That's why you ought to be in a connect group. That's why you ought to have a quiet time every day. Why? So you can know his words. He said, well, why is that so important? You can't remember what you don't know. But if you do know his words, let me tell you what will happen. Your morning will turn into dancing. Your night will turn into day. Your pessimism and problems will turn into possibilities, and your hurts and your hopelessness will turn into hope if you just remember his words. Remember his words. Luke says, and they remembered his words. The women had been confused. The women had been frightened. And then the angels appear, and now they're rebuked. But now they're enlightened. But God's not done. He never is. Now they're witnesses. And watch out when a woman 
becomes a witness for Jesus. Look at verse 9. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. They were on a mission now. They had a story to tell. Jesus is alive. And Luke tells us in verse 10, who was there? Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Now, get the picture. You know, we always, we always glamorize and romanticize Bible stories, don't we? We always, in fact, Easter Sunday, you know, we're always talking about, you know, the, the apostles and all the wonderful people. And all. Here, here's the true picture. These guys were still asleep. These guys were hiding behind locked doors for fear of the authorities, and the women come knocking on the door, and I mean, they won't take no for an answer. Finally, one of them stumbles up to open the door, and they come in, and they start talking to these men, the apostles. Verse 11, Luke says, but these words seem to them to be an idle tale. They did not believe them. Now, the word for idle tale can be translated into our English language, nonsense. Nonsense. The women show up. They tell the men, Jesus is alive, guys. Tomb's empty. Jesus is alive. Remember, he told us, and it's happened and all that. And they're going, okay. See, the same thing happens if you try to come to my house when I wake up. I don't talk to anybody, and no one talks to me if they're smart. Now, my dog can. He can get away with it because, you know, the dogs don't talk back. And, you know, I know that's the end of the sentence. Well, but I'm not awake yet. Wait till I wake up. These guys were asleep, so we, maybe we can cut them some slack. Maybe they hadn't totally woken up yet. But here are the apostles telling these women, you're out of your minds. Get out of here. We're going back to sleep. In fact, the very word was a medical term used to describe the feverish ramblings of a serious patient. You're nuts. See ya. Dr. Kent Hughes said, these were the apostles. The men over whom Jesus had prayed for an entire night before calling them. Their faith would be the foundation of the church. Jesus had explicitly told them numerous times about his death and resurrection, but now they dismissed the women's witness about an empty tomb and called the angels' words, humbug. Like so many of us, they had heard and not heard God's Word. They never bothered to think that Jesus meant exactly what He said, end quote. Well, in verse 12, two words mark a turning point in this whole narrative. Two words. Verse 12, but Peter. But Peter. So, wait a minute. Are you talking about the fellow who denied being one of Jesus' closest followers? Wait a minute. Are you talking about the man who lied to the lady by the fire? Whoa, hang on here. Are you talking about the preacher who used profanity to deny he even knew Jesus? Are you talking about that guy? Oh, yeah, we're talking about that guy, Peter. Verse 12 says, but Peter. Now, to Peter's credit, despite the doubts of his fellow disciples, he went to check it out. But he didn't just go. Luke says he ran. Y'all love Peter, right? Now, John, in John's gospel, he makes sure you know in John chapter 20, verse 4, that both Peter and John ran to the tomb, and John got there first. Now, he doesn't say, I got there first. He goes a step beyond that. He says, the one whom Jesus loved got there first. You can check it out, John 20, verse 4. Verse 12 says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Get the picture. He he goes to the tomb. It's just as the women have said. The grave clothes are there. The napkin for his head is there. there. There's no body in He leaves, and he goes from no way to, to maybe. 
Maybe he is alive. Maybe I get another chance. One commentator said Peter saw the empty tomb, but he was still miles away from an Easter faith. The word was yet to take root, but when it did, he became a powerhouse. In fact, you want me to prove it to you? Listen to these words from Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24 on the day of Pentecost. This is Peter preaching, and this is what he says. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not for him to be held by it. Peter said, he's alive. He's alive. And the people in that crowd who heard him were cut to the heart. They said, brothers, what, what shall we do? What can we do? You know, it's an amazing contrast between the days of that first church, the days of Pentecost, when people were saying, what can we do to be saved? And to the modern church where people say, what can I do and still be saved? Right? Quite a contrast. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they did that day. 3,000 of them did that day. About as many seats as we have here today. They all came. I've got to give my life to Jesus because he's alive. He's alive. Let's pray.